Hi, my name is Gautam Bhatia and today I will be doing a review of the Supreme Court in 2019. 2019 was a very eventful year for the Supreme Court and it would be difficult in the space of this short video to do justice to all that went down. So I'll be briefly referring to many of the important judgments that came out and then flagging various other sources you could look to to read more about them. But before we start, I think it's important to recall an event that took place in April 2019, whose ramifications we are still dealing with. In that month, the Chief Justice of India was accused of sexual harassment by a former employee. The very day after the accusation was made public, the CJI himself constituted a special bench on a Saturday morning and himself sat on it. But after the bench, the hearing was over, removed his name from the list of judges. So the order now reflects only two judges. The week after, a separate bench sat, harangued the character of the claimant, insinuated conspiracies against the Supreme Court. And one Utsav Bes, who said that he had been approached by unknown people to undermine the Supreme Court, was given a special hearing. Soon after that, an ad hoc committee was set up to look into the complaint. The ad hoc committee did not follow the best practices that have been set down in the Posh Act and before that in the Vishakha guidelines. In fact, one judge who was on the ad hoc committee had to step down after it came out that he had already made statements in support of the CGI. The procedure of the ad hoc committee was so hostile that the complainant herself withdrew midway through the proceedings, citing the fact that she wasn't given a copy of her deposition she wasn't allowed to have a lawyer with her and so on. And the ad hoc committee then released the report exonerating the Chief Justice of all charges. Given the number of judges involved in this whole episode, no fewer than nine, this reflects not a failure of an individual judge or judgment, but an institutional failure of the Supreme Court to deal with sexual harassment accusations. And when the highest court in the land fails institutionally, that is a serious issue that we must all think about and ask ourselves what would accountability mechanisms look like going forward. Now, moving on then now to the actual law and the actual judgments. The second half of 2019 was dominated by Kashmir. On August 5th, various parliamentary resolutions and laws were passed that effectively negated Article 370 of the Indian Constitution. I say effectively. Now, three things arose out of that the series of events. The first, of course, was the constitutional change itself. That was challenged before the Supreme Court. After significant delay, a delay that saw the reorganization of the state itself come into force, the matter began to be heard in the, at the end of December. But no stay in the meantime was granted on the reorganization. So in a certain sense, status quo has already changed. Although the court has said that if it finds against the move, it will restore status quo. Secondly, the entire state was put under a communications lockdown starting that day itself. A, a large part of this lockdown in Kashmir still continues. And the hearing, the constitutional challenge to this was delayed by three months, finally heard in December and judgment is reserved. Keep in mind that this has been the longest internet shutdown in any democracy and the court is still to rule on its constitutionality. The third thing was the det detention of various political leaders. Various habeas corpus petitions were filed in the Supreme Court and an astonishing thing happened. The Chief Justice, instead of dealing with the habeas corpus petitions as law requires, which would mean asking the state to come in, justify the legality of detention, told the petitioners that you can go and meet the detained people as long as you don't engage in any political activity while you're there. This transformed the Supreme Court of India into effectively a Supreme Visa Issuing Authority of India telling people, giving them permission to travel within the country of India, subject to various conditions that have no basis in law and refusing to deal with habeas corpus itself, the most fundamental and basic of rights of an individual against state power. This reflected a gross failure on the Supreme Court's part to hold state power to account. Now, this, this theme, uh, failure of failure to hold state power to account, was a recurring theme in 2019. For example, electoral bonds that effectively allow for anonymous, unlimited corporate donations to political parties 
were challenged a year and a half ago. Throughout 2019, the court did not hear the challenge. When it finally began to hear it just before the general election of May, it said that since the case was complex, there was no time and it pushed it to after the election. Ignoring the fact that the reason why there was a rush at that time was because the court itself had not heard the case for many months. The case has still not been heard. Multiple election cycles have come and gone and the electoral bonds have continued and anonymous money has been donated in huge amounts predominantly to the ruling party because the rules of the electoral bond scheme are asymmetrically biased towards whichever party is in power at the time. That again, this judicial evasion where the court doesn't hear a case and in not hearing a case ends up favoring status quo and the state that benefits from status quo is again a serious problem with regard to enforcing fundamental rights. The third significant issue was the NRC, the National Register of Citizens. This was a court monitored process and this is something interesting because the NRC in Assam was a huge administrative exercise. This should normally be done by the bureaucracy and by the administration, but the court itself decided to oversee it. And as evidence showed, the court's processes were opaque, often sealed covers were used to take evidence, important issues were decided in behind closed doors meetings between the court and the state coordinator. And in the end, many people committed suicide out of fear and desperation at being left off the NRC. More egregiously, when a petition was filed challenging the inhumane conditions in detention centers in Assam, the Chief Justice asked the question that why aren't more people in detention and converted that PIL into a broad ranging inquiry asking why aren't there more so-called illegal immigrants in, in detention centers. For the first time, I think a constitutional court has, is asking someone why haven't you detained more people and in fact, Genocide Watch, which is the international body, issued a genocide warning with regard to the NRC. This must be the only time in, in history that a constitutional court's actions have led to a genocide warning. Where that leaves us is something for you to think about. This whole issue of sealed covers kept recurring again and again. Many times the court took evidence in sealed covers that only it had access to. This happened in the Raphael petition that spilled over in 2019. This happened when the PM's biopic was challenged. The court uh, asked for seal cover evidence. It also happened in the Chidambaram case. Although finally in that case, the court decried the whole uh, activity of sealed covers. And hopefully going forward, we will see very little tolerance for this process where fundamental rights can be made the subject of seal cover proceedings, where the counsel for the petitioner doesn't even have access to the material on the basis of which the case is made against her client. That is a serious concern for open justice and for transparency. Thirdly, uh, or next, we had the Sabrimala issue. Now, as you may remember, a year ago, it was the Supreme Court held that the Sabrimala temple's practice of disallowing women between the ages of 10 to 50 was unconstitutional, illegal and set it aside. There were violent riots that followed and a review petition was filed before the Supreme Court. Now, in review, the Supreme Court only has to ask that is there an error on the face of the record, something so blatant that anyone can see it or an, error, or an injustice of that kind. The Supreme Court did nothing of the sort. Instead, in the review judgment, the Supreme Court said that there are certain constitutional questions involving the interface between religious freedom and fundamental rights. And because these questions may come up in future cases, that are presently pending before the court, we will leave these questions open to be decided by a seven judge bench and that seven judge bench may also reconsider the Sabrimala uh, issue and the legal issues involved in that. Now, this is a, a bizarre interpretation of the review jurisdiction because the court effectively, without reviewing the judgment itself, reopens it and does that without even bothering to say or to, or, to, or to find what the fundamental error was in the original judgment. That's a very surprising and disturbing extension of the review jurisdiction. It implies that nothing then is final. Everything can be always altered at any point and the basic sanctity of precedent in a judicial system stands vitiated. 
The Supreme Court also passed some important constitutional judgments this year. One was judgment that the Chief Justice's office was subject to the RTI. Unfortunately, however, this judgment was hedged in with so many potential exceptions that its actual application and practice remains to be seen. Equally importantly, in the tribunal's judgment, the court struck down certain provisions of the Finance Act regarding tribunals and also said that on the question of the money bill and the extent to which the Supreme Court can review the Speaker's decision to certify a bill as a money bill has to be considered afresh because the Aadhaar judgment was unclear on the point. <coughs> and the court, in its opinion, indicated that indeed the certification of a money bill should be open to judicial review because if it was not, the central government exercising its majority in the Lok Sabha could effectively make the Rajya Sabha redundant and reduce the whole idea of bicameralism to a farce. In both these, in both these judgments, Justice Chandrachud wrote strong concurring opinions in which he went beyond the majority and laid down stronger rules both for RTI and for the money bill. And it, I think it is to be hoped that it is his concurring opinions that ultimately carry the day because they are much stronger on the issue of protecting fundamental rights right, to information and structural issues pertaining to our democracy. There were also other interesting judgments. In the beginning of the year, Justice Sikri struck down uh, certain licensing regulations regarding bar dancers in uh, Maharashtra. In the, in the month of May, Chandrashud Jay again had an interesting judgment striking down a shadow ban on the Bengali film Bhobishyatar Bhut and he laid down some important principles on the, on the issue of, of free speech and the constitution. Lastly, in, towards the end of the year, as we all know, the Citizenship Amendment Act was passed. Now that was challenged and the challenge is pending before the court. It will be heard next in January. At the same time, there were issues of so-called clashes between students and police in various places, beginning with Jamia University in, in Delhi. And the allegation was that the police had acted violently and, and had engaged in, in, uh, in brutal violence against students. Now, a PIL was filed before the Supreme Court. And very disturbingly, on the day of the first hearing, the court said that let the violence stop and then we will hear the petitions. We know how protests happen. Now, if a claim has been made under Article 32 of the Constitution, asking the court to protect fundamental rights, that cannot possibly be subject to a conditional hearing. The court cannot say that let X or Y things stop happening and then we'll hear a question of fundamental rights. That would leave fundamental rights entirely contingent on whatever is happening at the time and what the court thinks are relevant considerations. The truth is, the court is bound to hear these cases and to adjudicate them in accordance with the Constitution. And again, hopefully, this whole idea of making court hearings conditional on what the court thinks is good behavior will not be carried forward into 2019. So to sum up broadly, it's been an eventful year. And I would say two things. First, that the institutional failure that took place with regard to sexual harassment allegations against the Chief Justice needs to be acknowledged by the court and active steps taken to put in place an institutional mechanism that can adequately deal with allegations of this kind against higher judicial functionaries. And the second is that when it comes to naked brute state power and the rights of citizens, the court has allowed a lot to go, go by. It is still to me incredible that the Kashmir internet shutdown is the longest in any democratic country and there is still no judgment on it. It's incredible that unlimited corporate donations to political parties have been pending in the court for a year and a half. So in, in my respectful and humble view, the court's original vision as the sentinel on the, on the key wave of protecting fundamental rights needs to be reasserted because in 2019, the sentinel seems to either have been asleep at various times or just indifferent. And that's something that should alarm all of us. Thank you.